Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome back. Uh, the new thing today is that uh, we have a live YouTube stream, which will allow me to, I mean, record the videos you know, without violating any any university policies. Uh, I mean, because no one will, will be able to join, right? But you can always watch the stream, and uh, I assume it will be automatically recorded, which is fun, right? Uh, so you can you can watch it later. Uh, it would be still nice to have uh, people in person. And I see that we are rapidly losing people. So how many undergraduate students do we have? Oh, wow, man, guys, six, <laughs> automatic eight. OK, thank you. Everyone else is graduate, yeah. Undergraduates, yeah, somehow people don't want to show up. But anyway, so today we're going to talk about uh, x86 instruction set. The reason we are doing this is that uh, we will actually be using it in our homework assignments because in order to boot the operating system later on, we will have to write some assembly code. It will be simple and I will give you prototypes. And, uh, so don't get scared. Question. Are we ever going to do something like the journal where it's all about on their system? Yeah. I mean, you will boot into main uh, as homework number three, I believe. So homework number two will be shell, and homework number three will be booting into main. Right, so, it, and that's exactly why it's needed, because in order to set up the page table, set up the segmentation correctly, you'll have to use assembly instructions. Another reason we have to do it is when we, will be, when we look at implementation of uh, the fork and exact system calls, right, which we covered last time. Uh, you will need to understand how to set up the stack correctly to make sure that you know like everything is running. And it will be coming back uh, in this class often. So it makes sense to cover uh, x86 instruction set. So we'll spend two lectures today. Gentle introduction to the x86 instruction cell set itself. And then the next lecture will be on calling conventions, essentially how we call and return from functions, passing arguments, stuff like that, right? Uh, actually, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. So. Uh, we are trying to set up uh, office hours on uh, like for TAs and myself. I was arguing for times which are in the afternoon because I historically know that people have classes before like before 3 p.m. and after 3 p.m. usually people are free, right? So is that okay? okay? So we set up we set up a poll on Piazza. So if you care to show up, please uh, mark your choices. We will try to accommodate. Uh, the best, uh, the best time, which works for everyone. And then, uh, and what else? So quiz was due yesterday, homework is due, I think, Friday, right? So we're good with homework. It's not a hard one, right? But yeah, talk to us if you have questions. OK, back to x86 assembly. OK, so again, back to this. Uh, uh, couple of slides which I keep bringing up. So again, I keep asking people, what is CPU do, doing internally, right? And uh, the answer is that uh, this is actually from a, from a document which describes uh, uh, Intel security mechanisms and as an introduction just shows this uh, main loop of the CPU. So if you didn't take the architecture class, so just to look at this diagram and you have a decent understanding of what's going on, right? So this is called an, a CPU execution loop, and it essentially repeatedly does the same thing over and over, right? So remember, I was saying that there are, there are two magical registers which are important. And one of them is even more important because you can kind of, uh, one is pointing to the memory address, which contains the current instruction, which CPU will execute, right? It's called instruction pointer. 
Our alternative names can be PC or program counter. It's the same, right? So literally, if this is uh, a memory location X, 8001-0050, the value of this register will contain this number, right? So this is when I say points, it just contains the atoms, right? And the hardware will read this instruction from memory. The second register is a stack register, and it will become clear later today why we need the stack, right? So you can make computations without stack. So that's this, this register is less important, but still, it's very uncommon to have computations implemented without a stack, right? So bear with me for that. So, the, but the most important part is this instruction pointer. So what CPU is doing is it says, okay, are we okay to execute the current instruction, which is there in that memory, right? Because maybe some exception occurred while we were executing previous instruction and we have to do a uh, switch here and start handling an exception. Maybe it's like, remember I was saying timer interrupts. So maybe at this like, while the CPU was executing previous instruction, the hardware of a timer raised the like, physical signal, and the CPU says, okay, it's time to redirect execution to an exception and execute to it, and react somehow to this exception, right? So like, like interrupt from a timer, or maybe from disk, or maybe from a network interface, right? And I will talk later, we will understand how exceptions work. Uh, don't worry, so it, it's coming. How, how, how they work at the level of software, right? But imagine nothing like that happened, and we are, and it's the common case, right? Because exceptions are quite rare because they're reasonably expensive. So you actually, if you, if you have an, a device which sends a lot of exceptions, it can slow down your system considerably, right? But so if no exception happens, so the CPU says, okay, I'm gonna do a fetch step, right? So I will read the current instruction pointed by the instruction pointer, right? So essentially the CPU hardware will go and read this instruction, right? The content of this memory. So CPU doesn't really know yet which instruction is that, right? And you can imagine that these steps are heavily optimized. So at a high level, it's really read from memory. At the level of implementation, there will be a lot of caching and different strategies for how to make sure that this step can be done in one cycle. Because typical distance to memory is roughly 200 to 250 cycles, right? So if you pay this price every time, then it means that you are like, your CPU is doing nothing for 250 cycles, just waiting for this read, right? So you, the CPUs themselves know how to optimize it. The next step obviously is to, if you read this memory, you need to understand whether it's an addition or subtraction or something like that, right? Maybe it's a jump. So the CPU decodes this instruction, right? And says, okay, there's a specific uh, encoding. And what it means is uh, from, it varies from instruction set, from one instruction set to another, right? But in uh, one of the simplest ones is MIPS, right? And all instructions are 32 bits long, for example, in a 32 bit machine. And it has something like an opcode, like five bits here, which says, okay, this is maybe an arithmetic operation. Uh, there will be like uh, numbers of registers, like for example, five, seven, and one, for example, saying, and those are also like, I forgot how many, six bits or something, right? Or maybe five, because we have what, 32 registers, uh, five, right? And, and then maybe some additional function here, right? So, but essentially you can imagine that CPU looks at those bits and says, okay, I see that this is an arithmetic iteration. There's just some kind of a function here. So maybe it's a subtraction really, because we're doing something. Right, x86 set is a little bit more complicated. So instructions are variable lengths. So there are some instructions which are one byte, and some instructions which are, I would say, five byte, five bytes, but really they can be even longer. Right. So it's not very convenient. It's a little bit weird, but okay, whatever. x86 is designed this way. Let's let's leave with it. Right. So anyway, but the logic in hardware will will do this step and understand. Okay. We're about to execute addition, for example, and it will understand that like registers five, seven are involved as operands, like inputs to this command, to this operation, and maybe register one is where the result will be saved. And I was using MIPS as an example here, just because it's much easier. x86 is roughly the same, right? And we will take a look at uh, concrete examples of x86 instructions later. So the next step is register read, because those values 
like register five might contain, contain a value x55, register seven might contain, contain value x12, for example, right? And so those values are actually read from registers and in the next stop placed as inputs to the LU, so which is the core of the CPU in many ways because it does those performs those operations in silicon, right? So it's a collection of gates which knows which know how to, for example, do an addition, subtraction, logical operations like or and stuff like that, right? And okay, so result is then checked. Uh, maybe again, I was saying maybe there is a division by zero, and then you have to switch to an exception handling pass, right? So. Some exceptions come from the outside, so kind of from an interrupt, kind of like from a timer, right? And some exceptions are in line. Maybe you access the memory which is not mapped and it's a set fault, right? And we will, I will explain what it means later, but you can kind of guess that something wrong is happening, right? And okay, imagine nothing happened really and instruction executed correctly. Uh, at this point you say, look, I can commit the results so this addition of 55 plus 12 into the register one, right? So whatever this value is, 67, x67, right? Will be written back into the register, right? And it can happen that this instruction itself changes the instruction point, or maybe it was a jump or a function invocation call instruction, right? Then you change the instruction pointer according to the semantics of this instruction. But normally you just update the instruction pointer to point to the next instruction, right? This is logical because normally you just execute instruction by instruction, right? Let me erase everything on this slide and just animate it one more time. So if your instruction pointer points here, you executed this addition, then you incremented it. You incremented it by the size of this instruction since on MIPS, it's always four bytes on x86. Since this can be variable size, you have size off of this instruction and you essentially add this number to your instruction pointer and keep rolling like that, right? So reasonably simple, right? Any questions about it? Good? Yeah. Okay, so the question today is what are those instructions? Essentially, we looked at the system calls and that's the interface between application programs and the operating system kernel. Now we're looking at the, at the interface of a CPU itself. It's inter, interface between your, uh, between the hardware and the software, right? So essentially your compiler takes a C code as an input, compiles into like various intermediate representations. Often this is some kind of a tree, does a bunch of optimizations, but essentially spits out those machine instructions, right? So your program, which will leave it, which, which sits here in memory, is just a collection of those numbers, instruction opcodes, right? Programs will have different parts, either like it will have a data section, it will have a stack, it will have a heap as well. But this part of the program is called the text, because or code of the program, right? So this is really a printing system will just set instruction pointer to point to the beginning of this program. It's not. It's not always the very first byte of the program. Beginning can be inside, it doesn't matter. It's just the, the file which contains the program itself will, will tell you where the entry point is, right? But essentially this thing will get executed. And the question is that, what are those instructions, right? So, and this lecture is based on this uh, uh, write-up by David Evans, who is a professor at uh, Virginia. And then later on we'll take a look at uh, the same write-up, but which is converted to a different assembly syntax. So there are two, two assembly syntaxes which are popular today. One is from Intel, and this is what we are covering today. And this, another one is from GNU, right? And they are slightly different, but uh, I will like contrast them later. Intel is simpler, and that's why we're covering Intel in this lecture, just because it's easier to understand and easier to read in many ways. Okay, so, a couple of notes. We will be talking in this class about a 32-bit x86 instruction set. Uh, it's a little bit easier, and also the version of the kernel which we're using, this x86, will be using a 32-bit version of a kernel. So in real life today, you will most likely end up using a 64-bit version of a kernel. 
it's a little bit more complicated, but the step is minor. And when the differences are important, I will highlight the differences for you. So you will understand what, what is different, right? But it's a good start to, to just look at 32-bit instruction set. You are not missing much. And we have a 64-bit uh, port of XB6, which we, we build it, but we haven't migrated to it in this class because we really have to patch the book. And patching the book, uh, no one has time for that, but eventually we'll do that, right? But don't worry. So, okay. Uh, X86 itself is a reasonably sophisticated instruction set with a tons of its extensions, which we're not going to cover. So we'll just cover the core of X86 instruction set, which is reasonably simple. And again, it will give you enough information. And if you need something, you can always go ahead and read a manual. You will be just fine, right? So understanding the basic core is important. So, and if I ask you here, so what do you think those instructions are doing? Like, remember, we looked at the program, we said, okay, if I ask you, okay, can you guess what the interface of a CPU is? What kind of instructions you need? You probably can. Yeah, exactly, arithmetic iteration. So something like addition, subtraction, uh, ideally something like logical or, sorry, or and operations. And people are often confused, why do we need those? So we'll have to see. Uh, maybe multiplication, typically, you can, you can implement multiplication algorithm in software, right? So just with addition and subtraction, but it's nice to have it, right? Uh, division, maybe, uh, that's more or less enough, right? So what else? Yeah, tell us. Memory. Memory access, yeah. It, it's so easy that no one wants to say memory. Essentially, you want to load, remember, I said there's memory, and you want to load data from memory uh, where? Where are we loading data from memory? Two registers, right? So essentially, I know there is something like in x86, those instructions are called move. And essentially, you can have a memory location, which is an address here, which points here, and some kind of a register, RAX, for example. And uh, x86 is, is an unusual instruction set. It will allow you to actually move from memory to memory. We'll take a look in a second, which is weird, right? And typically on ARM or on MIPS, instead of move instruction, we will be using load and store instruction. So they are a little bit simpler, right? Because but you can, you know, you can implement the same, you can implement more complex move with a couple of loads and stores, right? Uh, what else do we need? What? Do, do, do. I didn't hear this. Jump. So we call in control flow. So essentially, you mentioned jump. And something like a call is a powerful instruction, which allows you to call functions, right? And we'll take a look at how it works in a second. But more or less, this is it, right? So if you took a whatever. 3810, which is computer organization, looked at MIPS instruction set. This is most likely what was covered there, right? And uh, that's sufficient to run a program, so you don't need much more. There will be different extensions, like, but uh, that's the core. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, the German call instruction, are those just like wrappers for, like, for just like, you just move something, the instruction, or there, you know? Correct. So are they they are actually distinct instructions. You, you're right saying that jump is an instruction which essentially allows you to in, modify instruction pointer. Uh, and, but like again, if you take a MIPS class, which talks a lot about how jump, jumps are implemented in the pipeline, it's a distinct, distinct instruction that has a slightly different encoding. Uh, and uh, like you can, why is that? Because you can do relative jumps, you can do absolute jumps, 
they have slightly different encodings. And the goal instruction is uh, is a combination of a jump and saving a return ad re return address on the stack, right? So internally, I think CPU, even x86, will implement it as a, actually, I don't know how x86 implements it because no one tells us. Uh, but you can imagine that it's like a combination of a jump and some, saving something on a stack. And MIPS, for example, doesn't have a call instruction. It just has a, a jump and link, which means that, uh, which is kind of similar. It just saves save the return address into a register versus on a stack. But okay, let's uh, let's take a look. Any other questions, by the way? Good. So it's an easy lecture, especially for graduate students. Right, so, okay, there's three groups, memory, arithmetic, control flow, right, which we identified successfully. So x86, 32-bit version, has eight general registers. So essentially, as a programmer, you can save and uh, put data in eight different registers. Each of these registers are 32 bits each, right, and they are given names. So originally it was, sorry, a, X, B, X, C, X, D, X. And when we moved to 32-bit versions, we got E extended, right? And so, for example, E, X register, this lowest part of the register, so bits 0 through 7 are called A, L. Bits uh, 8 through 15 are called A, H. And the upper part of the register is called A, X. And the whole register is called E, X, right? So you have EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. ESI, EDI don't have those splits, right? So they're just like 32-bit registers. There is uh, two additional registers, which is stack pointer and base pointer. And I will explain uh, what are this used for, right? So roughly speaking, they are more or less equivalent. So you can replace uh, them with, uh, like use them in, almost any arithmetic operation. EAP is a special register, right? You cannot change it directly. Only jump instructions and other control flow instructions can change it. And those two registers are somewhat special. So stack pointer is used by instructions like call to essentially save a return address on the stack. I'll explain how it works. And a base pointer is used by the compiler in some cases to maintain something what is called a stack frame, right? But it's not always necessary, but again, we will explain how it works. If I ask you a question, and again, sometimes people are confused. So where are these registers in terms of their proximity to the CPU? The registers are by each of the individual parts. Correct. So if I draw you a simple diagram, so because sometimes people are con confused and they say maybe registers are sitting somewhere here. Maybe it's memory. It's memory, but it's a memory which is implemented here. So if this is a CPU pipeline of a simple five stage MIPS CPU, so it has a program counter which reads instruction from memory, right? Uh, saves the intermediate result into, it's also a register which we call a ledge which allows you to self save intermediate results. And later on, this is the LEU, which essentially does it, implements addition, right? So this is the register file. It's, it's a memory. It's implemented as almost as, in a way similar to this big memory, but just it's a little bit faster and a little bit more expensive in terms of uh, gates, right? I was saying that this memory is so dense that it uses like one capacitor to store one bit, right? So this uses roughly five gates, right? But it's faster. And essentially it's inside the CPU, so it's some sitting somewhere over here, like, and it's a four core CPU. So you, there will be four, four of these pipelines and four versions of those uh, registers, right? And essentially the register values are read into intermediate uh, ledge register and then are provided as input into the LEU, right? LEU will do the addition, like place, intermediate results here, and maybe we'll later we'll save them to memory, right? That's how it works. Again, for people who never took uh, a simple computer organization class. Any questions about this? Uh, 
eight times four total registers, just because you're saying that you have hyper threads here, right? Oh, okay, okay, okay. What you're saying is this is eight registers. Uh, kind of. It gets a little bit more complicated than that because those are the registers which are visible to you as a programmer, right? So you can write an instruction which does something like move into EAX, right? In practice, this register file is a little bit more dynamic and those are called physical registers. And there will be physical register one and maybe up to physical register 32. There will be more physical registers in practice than visible names. And the CPU internally will do something what is called renaming. It's to eliminate essentially data dependencies between instructions, right? So again, my, my, my suggestion, I link this on, 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 I think under the first or second lecture, it's a link to Rajiv's videos on 3810. I, I suggest watch them. Okay, actually this, Rajiv doesn't teach this in 3810, I do. So then maybe find 3810 by me or graduate level class from Rajiv and watch those videos to understand what physical registers are and what log log logical registers are. It's useful to understand as a software developer because you might think that, okay, I really limited to eight registers, but in practice internally, like if you use two instructions which produce something inside the EX register back to back, this will might be assigned to physical register one, and this can be assigned to physical register two, right? Internally, and they can be executed even in parallel because there is no dependency. You're writing into two different physical registers. Is there a way to just tell you? Ah, uh, no. I think it's implementation specific. You can guess maybe, you can maybe get it from the Intel documentation, but maybe not even. There are like certain rules of thumb for how how many re uh, registers you, the CPU will maintain internally just to achieve optimal speed. But roughly like, let's say 128, but maybe even more these days, I don't know. Like it's, you really have to talk to a hardware architect and they will tell you. But I don't think it's publicly, easily publicly known because it's hidden from you as a software developer. But you, you should know it that to understand the performance figure. The fact that these two instructions can be executed in parallel, for example. Any other questions? All good? Okay. Uh, we will actually cover a little bit of register renaming when we get to meltdown, but it will be towards the end of the class. Okay. So now assembly language, right? Remember I said that uh, your program will have multiple regions, right? And the first thing you wanna do is a mechanism to essentially declare global variables, right? So they are declared with this data directive. So this is now a language of the Intel assembly, right? So Intel assembly is a primitive compiler. I say primitive because it doesn't do many optimizations. It doesn't do any optimizations, I think. It just translates what you write as a human. But it allows you to write things like, it allows you to assign human readable names to variables, stuff like that, right? And so just to step back a little bit, remember I was saying that your program itself, it will contain the text, right? Actual machine instructions with those subcodes, right? Which CPU will be executing, right? but it will have other sections as well. One of those other sections is a data section. And data section is essentially memory, which is allocated for global variables, right? You remember global variables from languages like C, right? So maybe this is like a value, value 10, and maybe there will be bytes like H, E, L, L, O, right? Individual bytes to keep the string hello, right? And uh, so this is exactly how the global variables are maintained. If I ask you the question, what two other kinds of variables are there besides global? Who can tell me? Static is global. Like local, okay, what is local? Who knows? They are defined inside the function. So if you have a function foo, uh, you will have int a, for example, right? And something 
And this is a local variable. So where will it be allocated? On a stack, correct. So, and we'll walk over that later. And what is the third kind? So this was one, this was two. What's the third one? Heap or dynamic, right? So, so dynamic. Uh, and those are the ones which we allocate kind of like, if you say int pointer p and you say malloc. So malloc is a function which goes into the library and says, okay, I will maintain the region of this memory and will allocate somewhere in this region memory for this integer, right? So stack will also be a section in the program, maybe here. And this is where this A will be allocated and heap will be here as well. And we'll come back to it many, many times within the next couple of weeks, right? So you will understand this in details. Just wanted to make sure that we understand those three things. So there is a data section to keep the global variables. There is a text section to keep the actual code of the program. There will be a stack where we allocate those local variables and there will be heap, which is maintained by malloc and free or new and delete operators in C++, right? Good? Okay, so right now we're talking about global variables. So data uh, directive, essentially, you can put dot data anywhere in your, uh, I said anywhere, but somewhere in your assembly program and it will start saying, okay, I understand that this is memory for those, for those uh, global variables. You can declare either a byte, you can declare a word, 16 or a two byte, 16 bit or a two byte location, or a double word, right? So essentially 32 bit location. Here's a couple of examples. So you say variable uh, size of a byte value 64, right? And it has a name, it's referred as a variable var, right? So here you say var two, you say again a byte, but it's uninitialized. We don't care what the value is. The compiler will place this in a special section, which is called uh, BSS. We will see more of it. It stands for better safe space. So essentially it's a section which you don't keep on disk, but when the program is loaded in memory, it's initialized with zeros, right? Why not to initialize it, initialize it to zero, right? On start. So, you can declare a byte without a label, right? And its location will be var2 plus one, right? Because it's the byte which follows var2. Doesn't have a name. And so on, like x, double word, uninitialized, y, double word. Oh, sorry, this is a word. This is a double word, uh, 30 thousand here, right? Easy, right? So essentially it's the global variables in your program. Arrays are just sequences of bytes. In assembly, right? So there are no high level syntax for declaring like uh, a two dimensional array. So what you do is that uh, you can say Z is an array. Uh, it's an array of double words and the values will be one, two and three, right? So, so for example, the value at location in memory Z plus eight is this one, right? Because each of them is, this is Z this is z plus four, and this one is z plus eight. Agree? Right, so we don't know where it is in memory, right? At the level of assembly, just because the memory is not yet allocated. So the, the, the assembly compiler will allocate memory for us when it just scans the entire program and figures out where it is, right? I think in sequential order, actually, right? There is also this dupe uh, expression, which allows you to duplicate uh, something a given number of times. So here, for example, you say, we will declare 10 uninitialized bytes. So you say it's a byte, we want it to do it 10 times, and we duplicate, and this value is uninitialized, right? Or you just give it a name, bytes. You give it a name, array, double, 100 of zeros, right? So essentially it's a, uh, you declare an array, 100, four byte words starting at location array. And all of them will be initialized to zero, right? Agree? And similar for strings, they're a little bit special. Oh no, actually, 
they are not special. So there's just slightly different syntax, so which allows you to write human readable strings. But really, all of this will be con converted to individual bytes because you say it's a byte. And this will be an ASCII number which represents H, right? And at the end, you say it's a zero because typically you don't have to do it, but most languages languages have different representations of strings. But C, for example, says, okay, that this string ends with a with a zero, right? You agree? String operations essentially will be scanning for this zero to make sure that that's the end of the string. Okay, reasonably easy. The next subset is data movement instructions. Essentially those things which allow us to move data from memory into registers, right? And we're gonna be using the following uh, notation. So register 32 will mean any of the 32-bit registers like EAX, CBX, and so on, right? Rack 16, any of 16-bit registers. We'll only have AX, BX, CX, and DX, right? Because ESI, EDI, and those guys, they don't have 16-bit parts. Register 8, any 8-bit register. AH, BH, CH, DH, AL, PL, CL, DL, right? And register is any register, right? Which means that instructions might take arguments of different type, right? And sometimes we'll have to narrow them down, and sometimes we don't, right? MEM is a memory address. So constant is a 32-bit constant, 16-bit constant, 8-bit constant, or any constant, right? Okay, let's take a look at how the syntax looks, right? So the first instruction is move. It copies the data from uh, data item referred by its second operand, so meaning this one. It might be a register or a memory, right, or a constant into the location referred by its first operand, right? So it moves from here to here in this syntax, right? And it can be a register to register. So you can write something like move from EAX, from EAX to EBX, right? It can be from memory to register. It can be from register to back to memory. So this is effectively a load and this is a store. You can move a constant into a register or you can move a constant into memory, right? So here's a couple of examples. So this first one copies the byte value of EBX into the EAX register, right? This allows you to store five into the byte location uh, pointed by a var, right? Remember, we gave, we declared like a, declare a byte, we gave it a, a name var, right? Maybe it was uninitialized, right? I forgot the exact syntax here, right? But uh, essentially it says, okay, we will put the constant five into the memory location in this data section, which is pointed by this var address, like var name. In when, when everything gets compiled, these values will actually be replaced by actual addresses like 8001, for example, right? But right now, it's just a, a label, right? Because assembly allows you to forget about the actual addresses and just work with those human readable labels, which, which is convenient, right? So here we have, like, and note this syntax, this braces. It means that you're addressing memory, right? So we again see this syntax here. Let me erase everything on this slide. So we say move four bytes because we don't have a specifier here which means that by default, it will be a 32-bit value. Uh, four bytes in memory at the address contained inside the EBX register into the EAX register. So what happens here is there will be a memory. Imagine EBX contains uh, OX80011005, for example. That's the address. This, For example, this is zero. This is the max address, right? And this is the OX80011005, right? And whatever is contained there, maybe at X55, gets moved into the register EX, right? So EX will contain X55 after this operation is performed, right? Uh, similar here. So moving the content of the EBX register into the memory uh, pointed by the var, right? You can do instructions which do arithmetic operation here. So you can say, move four bytes at memory address ESI plus minus four, right? And you write it as minus four 
into EAX, right? So this is how it will go. And vice versa, you can move the contents of uh, CL into the byte at address ESI plus EAX, right? So the CPU will compute this address for you, and then you will essentially, since this is a byte, it will do an operation on a byte, right? Any questions? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I don't have an example, but I think it's legal. And uh, it would be fun if I'm wrong. I can be wrong. So how about you check? No, like the way, how do we check? Let me show you. Because no one is really perfect, and I don't know either. So you say x86 move. <laughs> And you quickly land like on this wonderful guide which we're using, but you also land on online instruction manuals, right? There will be a bunch of those, right? And it will tell you, it will tell you what this instruction can do. And it says, uh, two, 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 two. can it move from memory to memory? So it has to, has to have memory in memory, right? Maybe it cannot actually. I was wrong, probably. So everything what I see is register to memory or register to register. I I probably was wrong. So double check, but most likely I was wrong. So it's it's the limitation. You you cannot move from memory to memory. So you probably have to do any. But again, like let me double check myself. Don't remember. Thank you though for the question. Any other questions? All good? So for example, just a more concrete example. Imagine you have a data structure point with two integers, right? Integer fields X and Y, right, which are coordinates. And you have a you have a array of of 128 points, right? This is how you declare it in C. This goes, like, if it's in a global scope, meaning it's not a local variable and a function defined globally, right? Then it goes into this data section. And if you want to implement something like access the ice element of this array, specifically its Y field, this one, and load it into a local variable Y, right? Then this is the assembly instruction which will get generated, right? So for example, you will have, uh, since the size of this data structure is eight bytes, right? You can say, okay, guys, this is my i, my index, multiplied by eight. EBX is the base of this array, so essentially points to the start of this array. EBX points here, i points, EAX points, not points, but it's equals to i, right? You multiply by eight, and since this is an offset four, because it's a second field in the data structure, you do plus four. So this is expression is actually legal in x86 assembly, right? Just for convenience of accessing those fields. And if you will, if you, for example, and it's a little bit easier to understand by example, if instead of instead of loading the actual value of y into this variable y. You want to take an address of y, right? So essentially what you want to compute here is you want to compute the address of this element, right? So if this is x and this is y of this ice element of the array, this is the base address x, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, for example, right? And this is some element, so it will be plus some delta here. So your address will be plus delta, right, this address. Right? So if you want to compute it, there's a special instruction which is called load effective address, right? And uh, it works very really similar, right? So it essentially says this expression and load effective address, you say this is the base of the array, this is the index, so 8 multiplied by EAX will essentially define this delta, plus 4 will also be added to the delta, and this address will be loaded in the ESI register. So is this the same as just 
basically doing the construction, but instead of brackets, like would it be the same result? Uh, no, like because in a move instruction, if this value is 55, then your EDX ends up with 55. In this example, ESI will end up with something like OX 8001 let's say 40, right? Because, or to be more precise, let's say 44, right? So this is, we're computing the errors. It's just a convenient instruction which allows you to compute the errors in one single step. All you say is why, why can't I just do an arithmetic operation? And it's a different, different, different kind of a philosophical question. Like at some point, CPUs, CPU designers decided that they want to diverge, and they want to say one was implementing a simple, or uh, what is it called? Uh, one was implementing a complex instruction set. Complex design. What is CISC? What C stands for? Complex instruction set computer computing. And one is was uh, risk. Says stands for reduced, right? Meaning that x86 is a CISC, meaning that it has those complicated instructions. And high level reason for that is that they thought that it will be easier to optimize hardware to implement those instructions in one cycle. It turned out to be a wrong branch of evolution and essentially it turned out that risk which only provides very primitive operations like load store if you want to do this in risk it will involve you like real a couple of additions in a register right but all operations are so simple that you can optimize the pipeline reduce the length of the cycle and just essentially internally do multiple optimizations that this CISC is way faster turn out to be way faster paradigm, right? Up to the point that x86, x86, x86 CISC is translating those complicated instructions. When it sees this, and I don't know concretely whether it does it for this one, but you can guess, it will translate them into internally into a several, a sequence of micro operations, which are called micro ops. And it will be something like a like in this example, it will not be a load, but it will be kind of arithmetic operations on registers, right? And again, it just turned out that it's easier to optimize this way. Uh, question. Yeah, um, I still haven't really understood the transition. Yeah, let me just. Uh, so imagine this is this array which we're talking about, right? This is this point which contains x and y, right? It's an ice point, right? The beginning of the array, imagine its address 8000000, right? Okay. So what move is doing, it places the result in the EDX register here. Imagine you have 55 here. Move will place 55 into EDX register. What load effective address is doing, although it's written almost identically, just uses a different register here. Instead of placing 55, it will place the address because of this operator here in C, right? So this address, imagine it's OX8000, imagine 0040, and since it's plus 4, 44. So this is the result which will be placed into the ESI register. So ESI at the end will contain 8000044. So that's the difference. 55 is an actual data which is stored at that address. And LIA just gives you the address itself. So you can think of LIA as a sophisticated uh, arithmetic operation, which was originally designed to compute those addresses efficiently in one cycle. But you can very well abuse it, right? So you can you say, well, I am a tricky person. I just know that I want a Leah to compute me something, right? And this is all legal, right? Because at this point, maybe it's data structures, but maybe it's, I don't know, tensors, matrices, matrices, right? So anything can be here, right? So it doesn't matter. So it's an instruction which allows you to work with three operands because typically addition works with uh, uh, just two, right? And here you say, look, EAX, 
saves EIX, EBX, and moreover, it doesn't require an additional register, it saves into the EIX itself. So roughly speaking, which means that it was out overriding EBX, right? So you don't have to, uh, you, can, you can pick a register in which you wanna place the result and just use this arithmetic operation. It's also a sophisticated multiplication uh, by two, three, four, five, eight, and nines, since n is limited to this n, which is allowed in Lia is one, two, four, and eight, right? So I don't, I don't want you to understand this, but just you will see sometimes that Lia has nothing to do with computing addresses of data structure, but is used as a sophisticated mathematical or any kind of operation. Isn't that part of EBX uh, yeah, I think so. We will talk a little bit because addition on x86 will be something like EBX, EAX, and which means that EBX gets the value of EBX plus EAX, which means that you lose the old value. And Lee allows you to avoid it and say, okay, I'll put it in a different register. Yeah. Addition is coming in a second, right? It's a little bit unusual, but again, they designed the instruction set this way. Any other questions? Uh, x86. To those additions, I think, if I remember correctly, and we'll see it in a couple of slides, I think that will be the semantics. So it will essentially lose the value of EBX by placing the new value back into it. Is that the question? Yeah, the only uh, like other the uh, uh, Yeah, so for example, MIPS and ARM will have something like add uh, register one, register two, register three, and it will be R1 gets R2 plus R3, for example. Yeah, so they, they I, I cannot say that it's the only one, but that's, maybe there's another instruction set which does the same, most likely, but. Yeah. Okay, so we got through the memory operations. Let's get to the logical, arithmetic and logic instructions. So addition, right? Addition instruction adds together its two operands, storing the result in its first operand. This is exactly what we were talking about, so essentially, uh, both operands can be registers, at most one can be a memory allocation, right? So it can be either here or here. This can be a constant or you can add memory with a constant, right? And place result back in memory, right? This, this is kind of weird. So typically on, on ARM, it would be like load, like you will first have to compute something in memory, in the register, sorry, and then load it back or store it back into memory, but x86 allows a single operation which operates on memory, right? So here's a couple of examples. So add EAX plus 10, right? So essentially EAX gets a new value. If it's a byte value pointed by the location of R, so we add 10 to this, to this memory location, and it's a single byte which is stored, right? Uh, subtraction works similar, so essentially uh, stores the value of its first operand, stores the, stores, what, stores in, what is the in? Okay, just easier by example, so AL, AH, AL gets a new value, AL minus AH, right? So it's this one minus AH, gets back, puts back into AL. Subtraction on the register, so essentially EAX gets a value of EAX minus 206, right? So not super hard. There is a special case, increment to decrement. Increment the contents of its operand by one and decrement decrements the content of, content of its operand by one as well. So decrement EAX subtracts one from the contents of the EAX register. If it's a memory operand, subtract one uh, from the value which is stored right, in memory pointed by bar. So essentially, if you have a memory here, something there is like 16. Since it's an increment, it will get 17, right? And the bar will be a memory address. Uh, bitwise logical and or and XOR. Uh, 
perform the specified logical operation uh, on the operands, placing the result in the first operand location. So essentially here, it's EAX. Oh, it says clear all but the last bits of EAX. Who can tell me why it works this way? I mean, I ran into the case where people don't understand those bit operations, right? Imagine this is EAX. It contains some bits like one, zero, one, one, and so on, right? And maybe one, zero, one, one, right? Since we do an end with this mask, which is zero F, which mask will look like this. Do we know how F is represented in binary? Nope. Look, it's just one F and it's 32 bits. Right? So again, so what is what will be the value of this? You're saying all ones, right? No, H just stands for hex. Exactly, all zeros and the last four bits are ones, right? Because F is essentially, this is F in binary, right? So F hex is four ones in binary, right? And so when you do an end, so since you're ending with zeros here, no matter what you have here, the result will be zero, right? And you will have all the zeros. Here you're ending with ones, which means that those bits will survive. It will be like one, zero, one, one, right? In the final result. And so essentially this allows you to clear bits. You will see why it's important because later on, like for example, if you want to clear certain bits and write it back to the page table, right? So that's where you use them. Maybe you maintain a bitmap of unallocated blocks on, on your disk device, right? And you say, look, I want to clear one bit because one bit is means that I switched from unallocated to allocated status, right? So those bit operations are important. That's important. Uh, that's just the syntax of x86 assembly, I would assume. So normally in C, it will be something like x, f, right? Uh, here they write it as 0, f, h, right? You just guess from the quantum. Sorry, from the quantum. Why would you use 0 instead of moving 0? Yeah, that's a good question. So you're jumping to this one, so which essentially is a funky way because XOR, if it's one and one, results into zero. If it's zero and zero, results into zero, right? So if you XORing with itself, no matter what bits you have, you will end up with zeros, right? Uh, I don't think there is a good way. Well, there is a good reason. Uh, it's, it's in the domain, it's from the domain of instruction level optimizations. I'm guessing that the XOR is a one byte instruction. And uh, if you put a constant kind of like load zero in the EDX, it might take you take you more bytes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but just my guess, you can double check. It matters only in like very narrow domains where you like on an embedded system and you're, you're trying to squeeze as much instruct, as many instructions as possible in the fewer amount of, you know, bits because you know your your memory jumps from like two dollars to four, which doubles the cost of your solution, for example, right? Uh, but modern compilers will have flags saying optimize for space or optimize for for performance. And I don't even know what is the answer today, which one is faster. I would assume they execute in the same amount of cycles at this point. But that's like a funky way to do this. Like again. I'm pretty sure that if you really start preparing for those job interviews, it's a, for whatever reason, this is a popular, I mean, I, I don't do many interviews right now. So, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, I, back in the days, like maybe five, seven years ago, it was popular to ask those questions on the job interviews. So by the time you have to prepare for those, for those, you have to understand like bit operations. Right now, just in our class, there will be nothing quite unusual. Everything will be very, very straightforward. I mean, like, if we want to clear a bit, we will clear a bit. Like, 
So if you want to clear all the, like, the last thing, you could look at zero and have that. Yes. Okay. So if you want to clear all but the last eight, you will write something like zero F F H. So the zero just like fills in the rest. In no, the zero just I think it just tells them that it's a text value. I yeah. don't think you have to write. I mean, it's it's similar to I, I would guess, and I'm not hundred percent sure that it's like for the parser in the language to understand that whether it's a hex con constant or that you can. You can judge by this h, so I'm not sure why zero is important here, right? And in C, it will be zero b, if I remember correctly, is a binary value, and zero x is a hex value, right? And I don't think there is any other besides decimals that I can be wrong because I don't program that much anymore. Any other questions? But we can play, I can, like, again, the goal of this class is not to listen to me. But to just, uh, and like it will become clear next time, you can take an assembly compiler and just try. And if it rejects it, well, and maybe some assemblers will accept them and some assemblers will reject depending on what they can accept, right? And I mean, like, I, I cannot know all of it. I mean, never tried to it, to be honest. Okay, because it's changing anyway. So, any other questions? All good? Yeah. I think that this instruction is something like maybe four bytes, and this one is most likely one byte. And I again, don't listen to me. Just uh, try it, and like I'll show you how to try next time. But it's it's a, it's a good question, and like those questions have to be asked. Uh, the, the field is moving so fast that, okay, I have this book, Instruction Accurate Optimizations, from whoever it was popular back in the days. So I can read it next time. Most of this stuff gets outdated. There's another useful book online, uh, which is, we will come back to this book, which is Agnar Hawk Instruction Tables. And Instruction Tables, essentially, there's this professor, Agnar Fog, I forgot the institution, University of Denmark, uh, who maintains essentially measures the cycle time which it takes to execute a, a specific instruction, like for example, a move with register and an immediate value, which is a constant, on each process, or each generation of a x86 CPU. Like for example, this is Skylake X. And he says that, okay, it takes uh, one cycle to execute, right? If we search for something like Zor, um, like, I don't know why search doesn't work. Oh, okay, it works. So it also will tell you that it's one cycle, right? But there is this reciprocity, 0 0.5. Let's not get into this today. But this is a good, 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 good source of first understanding what instruction takes, what, what it takes to execute one instruction, and also it, he maintains those optimization manuals. So often those guys are actually in the most recent. Uh, and again, he covers only a subset of those optimizations, but essentially you can read through those manuals. He is pretty well known about for, for this work. So you can you can read and if you're really in a in a position to get the last cycles, and I occasionally I am in this position because of my work. Uh, you can you can you can look at those right it, it can be useful uh, okay sorry for a detour any other questions good like it matters when you multiply matrices right or write video game engines and you you have to squeeze every bit of performance out of your rendering engine or something right and those people i mean it's it's well compensated position so just it's, it's an interesting thing to do Okay, shift left, shift right. So essentially, it shifts the value in the register by one byte, which effectively means that you multiply by two. If you if you think about the mass, what the number is, like the number in the AX is uh, like uh, the bit number 32 uh, multiplied by what? By the 
2 to the power 31 plus bit 31 multiplied by bit 2 to the power 30, right, and so on. Oops, sorry, uh, bit 0 multiplied by nothing, right? And so essentially, if you shift, you essentially get, you throw away this one, this one gets here, so it's essentially equivalent to multiplying by 2, because it's effectively, you're raising the power from 30 to 31, right? Agree? With the mathematics here, so essentially shifting left is multiplication by 2, shifting right is division by 2. But sometimes you shift for different reasons as well, for like bit manipulations as well. So essentially, here you have some variable number. Oh, okay, you're dividing by whatever value is in the N is inside, is inside the CL register, and you're just shifting. And essentially, which implements division by two. Okay, we can spend more, so, but let's move on. So, integer multiplication. In this class, you're not going to see this instruction. We're not going to be multiplying anything. But essentially, what it does is multiplies the contents of EAX by the whatever is contained here in memory, 30-bit content in memory, application pointed by var, right? So this is also allowed. You say multiply. Oh, this is actually, look, this uses a different register. So it says we will multiply EDI by 25 and place it inside ESI, right? There is also division. There is a not, right, which flips all the bits. There is negation, essentially, which moves you from uh, I think I think it's like a two's complement uh, because this is how you encode negative numbers. So it's minus EAX gives you AX value, right? It just for information purposes, that those instructions are there. So don't get scared. Okay. What we talked about up until now is arithmetic operations, right? So it's essentially allows you to write any code which goes straight, right? Now you need some instruction which allow you to implement something like if conditions, for loops, right? While loops, if you like them. Question is how? What do we need for this? You need what? Conditional branch. You need conditional and non-conditional jumps, right? Let's call them jumps. So we will call those control flow instructions. So again, remember this diagram we say, normally instruction pointer just goes to the next location. But some of these instructions allow you to change the value of instruction pointer. Remember, instruction pointer is not in a set of general registers. So you cannot change it by just move instruction, writing the new value into it. But you can change it through a specific set of instructions, which are called jumps, right? Uh, that's essentially the slide which does it. So assembly allows you to declare labels. So essentially just human readable markers of the position in the code. So for example, you say this is a begin. So this instruction, the address of this instruction will be where my label is currently point by the, pointed by the label begin, right? And uh, those labels will simplify instead of like, because you don't really know where the or specific instructions will end up in memory. So as a human, you just assign those labels and then use them in jump and in, in the conditional and unconditional jump instruction. So essentially the syntax for a jump is like this, jump to a label. So it transfers program, it control flow of a program to the instruction at the memory location indica indicated by this operand, right? So essentially if you declare the label begin, you are executing sequentially, and this is a non-conditional jump, means that the, when the program reaches this instruction and executes it, your instruction pointer will become pointing, will, will be set to point to this XOR instruction again, right? So which allows you to implement an infinite loop, for example, right? If you like. Agree? So, of course, Non-conditional jumps are insufficient because you sometimes have to exit the loops, right? And you say, look, we need a jump only when condition is true. 
So conditions are a little bit unusual in x86. So uh, it maintains, it has a special registers, which is called flags. And E stands for a 32-bit version of this register, E flags, right? And this register stores information about the last arithmetic operation. So for example, bit six in the E flags register indicates that the last result was zero. Bit seven indicates that the last result was negative, right? And based on these bits, x86 implement different conditional jumps. For example, JZ jumps when the condition is zero, right? When the last arithmetic operation was zero. Otherwise, the execution proceeds to the ne next instruction. So let's take a look at how it works. So first of all, what is the set of those conditions? So you can jump on equal, E stands for equal, jump not equal, jump zero, jump greater, jump greater or equal, jump less, jump less or equal, right? And so for example, uh, x86 provides us compare instruction, which is called CMP. It compares EX and EBX, right? And sets the bit in the EFLAX register. And then jump less than equal, only is true when this comparison essentially less than equal, right? And you jump to the done label. It can be either backwards or forward in the program. So this allows you to essentially uh, implement conditional branches, uh, loops with essentially the statement which allows you to exit, right? So for example, if you have something like a for loop, you have I started from zero, I plus plus, and then you say I is, let's assume it's equals to 100. That's an exit condition. Right? Uh, it's a bad exit condition. You will exit immediately. You have to do something like less than 100. It's better. So normally you will check for this condition and there will be jump uh, when greater, what is that? Jump when greater or equal and you will do a CMP of your I, let's assume I inside EAX with 100, and you can say jump to exit, right? And exit will be somewhere over here, that's your label. And if not, then here will be a non-conditional jump back to the, for example, loop label, which you will place somewhere here, right? That's how you a compiler can encode a for loop. Any questions about it? Similar for if then else branches. So one branch will essentially will be immediately following the comparison statement. So kind of like this, like if you do some kind of a CMP, you will have a, some conditional jump here, which either will land you on a second part of it, if then else statement, or if you don't jump, you essentially fall through here and then jump non-conditionally over this second part, right? So that's an encoding for if then else. Agree? Any questions? Easy? So I should probably stop here uh, because that logically will lead us to the calling conventions next time. So let me ask a couple of questions. So are we okay? So we do, do we understand like, okay, let's just for the sake of like, we still have like four minutes. Let's uh, encode uh, something like uh, if then else. Like let's imagine we have a C code which says if A equals greater than zero, then do them. Uh, else do else. So how will we encode it in the assembly? So what's the first instruction assembly, which helping us to encode this check? Compare. So let's say EAX with zero. Yeah, and then what's here? Jump, which jump? Conditional or non-conditional? So what's the condition? Uh, jump when greater to else 
go to them, right? Okay, let's, let's assign a label then here. What's here? So we're executing else. Yeah, it's a fall through. So we fall through else, executed some instructions here in else. What will be there here? Jump. Let's say after, which will be here. So what's inside then? Yeah, whatever then. And here nothing, right? Because we just fall through, right? So this is how it works. Any questions? And there are multiple ways to encode it, obviously, right? So we can place the else condition uh, after the then, and like we can negate this condition if there are like multiple things here, like greater than zero and B is greater than zero, then you have to encode it as well. But you, you kind of see how it goes. Okay, let's stop here and we will continue with function invocations and calling conventions next time. Thank you.